everyone. Welcome to an exciting edition of ARG Presents. I am Amigo Aaron, joined by our resident Coco Nut. I give you the Brent. We're just going to be playing Dallas No, again, sir. Right? No, sir. You know, this oh. is a special week uh, leading into the uh, month of September. We have finally rolled the international renowned, super spectacular, everyone's favorite, the color computer, Brent. The TRS-80 color computer will be the subject of today's show now uh yes the lock piece that finally spun the wheel said you know what it's time it was right i've got the piece right here you see the lock on it we spun the wheel last week we made the exciting deal uh and this came up brent tell the people why why are these on the wheel and what do they mean uh all the three fallen shows that uh were uh cut due to time restraints uh, had been placed on the ARG wheel for prosperity. And even if they are spun, they stay on the wheel to possibly be spun a, a second time, a third time, a fifth time. So we might do, be doing TRS-80 again it next week. We'll have to see at the end it of the show. It could be. It could be. I've been informed uh, by the guys over at Coco Talk that this is Septandy. Brent, hashtag yes. Septandy. So uh, how appropriate. That this, the first week in September, we uh, roll the Coco. Now, we've had a look at the Coco once before uh, on ARG Presents. Uh, we played yes. uh, Dallas Quest. And do you remember what I picked for that show right off the top of your head? I can't even remember. It's been so long ago. I don't remember any games yeah, outside and of Dallas we, Quest. It is the ultimate and we game. Also, it, we also did a Dragon episode. And I believe we played a, a soccer game was one of the games we played. And that, that was pretty impressive. Uh, so we've had we've had a couple cups of coffee with the uh, with the Tandy slash Dragon. So we're back again again for more. Now, Brent, what were you? You know, we grew up. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we grew up uh, with Tandy computers here at the house. Uh, uh, we had uh, the Coco Two, then we uh, upgraded to the Coco Three, and eventually we ended up yes. getting a Tandy One Thousand SL and a Tandy One Thousand TL, the uh, DOS machines. Uh, what do you recall? Um, we've talked obviously Dallas Quest, your favorite game. Do you recall any games that you enjoyed on the Coco back in the day that were that you remember? Uh, uh, Dallas Quest was definitely the game I played probably the most on the Coco. But there is tons of good games with the Coco, most of which were reviewed on the uh, uh, now fallen on TRS eighty show. Yeah. Uh, it was if you want a you guys hit all the premium games on that. And if you want to list a good uh, Coco games, you can just go watch any of those episodes with you and John. And uh, they're pretty much all winners. You know, it's funny because getting the, getting this uh, show to uh, this Coco show to, uh, together this week, I wanted to get a, a, a good chunk of game footage to show in the background. Like I do in our video uh, format. And I didn't see a video out there that did the job for me. So I went, you know, I, I recently put together that the front end for uh, the Tandy on Coin Ops. So I ended up taking all the video that I made. I generated a lot of video. I didn't realize how much video. I took all the video I generated and put, stuck it together to one huge video and uploaded it to YouTube. And it ended up being a, a one hour and 39 minutes of, <laughs> of video. I couldn't believe how long it was. Uh, to uh, uh, so if you want to watch just a, a, a almost an a, almost two hours of Coco video, uh, there that's a, that's uploaded on the Amigos Retro Gaming channel if you want to check it out. But uh, as I was watching this go past, there are so many great games that I remember, including some arcade ports that you forget that were how good they were. Arkanoid was was a great game. The clones like Pop, like a uh, uh, Sailor Man, Donkey King, those are great games. Uh, I watched boat streams from Coco the other day, and he had this. He played this game that almost like was like a Doom like quality. It was quite remarkable. Uh, it's the Tandy. They were made. They managed to squeeze out a, a lot of great stuff, and there's still stuff coming out to this very day. And so it's it's very exciting. It's an exciting time to be in the Radio Shack Coco family and playing some of this stuff. And uh, we were happy that this came up uh, on the wheel. So we're not going to beat around the bush here, Brett. We're going to get right into it. Uh, you ha couldn't play Dallas Quest this week. You that was off the table. No, I tried. So you wouldn't let. What me. you're going to do <laughs> is you're going to have to pick another game. I know it hurts you, 
and your bizarre affiliation with Dallas Quest. I mean, you you're the Dallas Quest guy, which is bizarre to me. But did you watch the show Dallas? <laughs> Uh, nope, I mean very, very okay, little. I, very, I, I, I watched. Uh, I remember the who, who shot Jr. stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, about I, it. Everyone remembers that. That was a huge deal. Even if people didn't watch the show, were interested in knowing. So, what did you end up selecting as your game this week? Uh, I picked a game that actually goes by two titles. Uh, the the name that I wasn't familiar with was the Sacred Armor of Anti-Rad, uh, or better known to us as Rad Warrior. And this was a game that was least released on several different platforms, the uh, Amstrad CPC, the Commodore 64, the MSX, the Spectrum, the Apple II, which is a really good port. Uh, I checked that out as well. Uh, it came out for the uh, IBM PC and the TRS-80. And it came out from 86 to 88, the Coco being the last re uh, release of the game. And Rad Warrior follows uh, a gentleman that you play by the name of Tal, who, as you get a comic book with the game, and as the comic book explains, the world was divided into North and South factions uh, and ended up the peace treaties broke down because everyone knew that the other side was making this armor that would uh, prevent radiation and would basically, if the other if one side bombed the other side, they could all get into these suits and they wouldn't get hurt. So before either side could perfect the suit, they launched all the bombs and destroyed the planet. And uh, that happened in the in the wonderful far off year of 2086. So Rad Warrior could still be on to something here. And after that, the world took all all the technology was gone and uh, started going back into these caveman like tribes for the survivors. And life was okay, you know. Obviously, it sucked, but. As time went on, life became the caveman life became normal. So that started working out for everybody. And they were all peaceful. The tribes, all the tribes started getting along with each other. And then it happened. The aliens come. And the aliens are like, screw you guys. Started just killing everybody. All the women and children, and then all the able able-bodied men were sent into the mines to mine ore for the aliens. <clears throat> so the the elders of all these tribes were like, you know what, this stinks. We're going to have to go back to the old ways, meaning technology, and stop these aliens. So you, as Tal, they start growing as a small baby and training him to take over the last remaining... Uh, armor suit that would stop all the radiation and be able to defeat the aliens. And you pick up right as he is getting near the armor, and you have to fight to get to the armor, fighting the aliens the only way a caveman can, and that's to throw rocks at, at them. <laughs> um, some aliens, the rocks won't affect. Uh, some aliens are take several rocks, but you can defeat most of the aliens with these rocks to get to the rad suit. And once you're there, you go to put it on, and you find out that it doesn't work. Like, the only thing that works is you, you get some part of it, and you put it onto your caveman body, and then you can monitor your vitals. Uh, you can... It gives you information about how many lives you have left, because before that, your HUD's turned off. And... You see it down there, but it doesn't give you any information. So you're just running around throwing rocks looking for the suit of armor. And if you try to get into the armor and try to use it and take off with it, it's like, no, it's like it's too damaged. So the rest of the game, after you find the armor, is tracking down pieces of the suit to bring back so that you can get the armor functional. And if you go and get the uh, anti-grav boots first, you can actually get in the suit and fly around 
but you don't have any weaponry. So to, to actually fight an alien, you'd have to get out of the suit, throw your rocks to the alien, and then get back in your suit. <clears throat> Eventually, you get other pieces of the suit, like lasers, which you actually use a weapon inside the suit. Uh, you get shielding, you get uh, uh, bombs to advance farther on. And the whole goal of the game is to get to the alien reactor and blow it up. And once that's blown up, uh, you'll survive the blast because you're in your suit, uh, and it will get rid of all the aliens. So that's a pretty good premise, in my mind, for a game. It's wacky. Uh, that's pretty yeah. good. That's pretty deep. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, it plays out better in description, in my opinion, uh, than it does in actual play. Uh, when you're in, when you're just as your caveman, you throw rocks, and the rocks go in this incredibly annoying arc. Um, usually, the, the enemies are, are either too low, and you throw over them, or you want to throw more in a straight line, but you all the throws are arced. So it's super annoying. It's really bad, and you have to work around it because there is no other thing. Uh, when I first got to the suit and I tried to get into it, and it, it, it pops you back out and it tells you, you know, no flight capability or something like that, I was so so angry. That was a real bummer because I wanted to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah I wanted to be actually in the suit and move around and fly around and do stuff. Uh, I had to eventually, I, I, I looked up a guide on where some of the stuff was, and I was able to get the boots and get off the ground, but not being able to attack anything, I couldn't get to the next piece. If you know what you're doing, if you know where to go uh, and, and what rooms the pieces are in, the game can be beaten in like 15 minutes. So it is a very, very short game. However, it's um, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to die a lot. And, and I, unfortunately, is on that side. There are certain enemies uh, that can get you into a death loop. Because when you die, you just fall down directly where yeah. you're at. And your body's all lumped up there. And if you're under something that's falling from the ceiling, like a goo drip, you will just... If it if you get caught into the bad cycle, as soon as your guy gets hut up, you'll get hit by another drip and go right back down. So, uh, stuff like that, the throwing arch of the rock, the general movement of your guy. I mean, he walks into full tiles, so it, it's really hard to judge some jumps. <clears throat> it's really hard to do some maneuvers. And the game is a platform game. It's a very uh, Metroid-esque game. Except the controls are, are not tight. And, and that's due to the animations that are kind of forced upon you. <coughs> I... Boy. I can't, in good faith, recommend this game. Because I think it is more frustrating than it gives out in positivity things that are positive about it the graphics are beautiful the animations are great uh <clears throat> some of your idle animations you can duck you can jump the running looks really nice and, and as for a coco game even though it is a coco 3 game um <clears throat> pretty spectacular uh the the sound is is nothing to write home about um I didn't have a great time with Rad Warrior. Uh, did you have any better experience? I had actually played this one before. Uh, yeah, Really? Well, All I right. played a lot of games when I was putting together that front end, and this was one of them. Uh, so I was familiar with it. <clears throat> this this game, is a, for me, it's a, it's a mixed bag. All right? and, I, and I'll explain why. What you've got here uh, is a very... Uh, uh, um, this was a very advanced game on the Coco, and I'm sure when they decided to bring this over to the Coco, because I believe there's also, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is out like, the C64 and, and some other systems. Yeah, um, it is. 
it's for a lot the, of yeah uh, but when they brought this over this this, this was this would have been a, a a title that you would not have expected to play on a coco it just this is not a this is the kind of not, not the kind of game you, uh, that you would normally find and so i give i, I give agree. a lot of kudos uh to have the jack to uh, try to bring this thing across all right uh, it's a uh, multi screen you know uh uh platform game that with with a lot of stuff going on all right now of, of course in in the tradition of say uh many home computers of the day this is the old half the screen taken up by this gimmick which you know and i'm sure they did that for performance reasons uh but i that it is sure. an irritant to me that when you half the screen's taken up with some kind of with the name of the game or some kind of weird thing that has nothing to do with the gameplay um the, the this game is not the easiest to control and uh due to the way that they've uh uh the way that, that the caveman moves and the way he throw chucks those uh rocks it's funny the rock chucking he's got a heck of an arm uh this guy does yeah i mean and but but it yeah. is one of those games where if you're gonna hit some of the rock this is not this is not one thing it's not metroid like is in the is in that area because you actually have to plan how you're going to throw that uh you know how the arc of the rock you've got the plan uh, i never i've never gotten the suit active i mean i've gotten to the suit you know uh you know you got this is what another thing that makes this uh sort of an interesting game is that uh, and uh curtis mentioned this in our chat this is a game that was released on cartridge and so you've crammed a lot on yes. there uh, and and there's a lot like i said there's a lot of decent looking stuff in here but a lot of the stuff i don't like i i i, I I, I don't necessarily like the plot of the game. I mean, I, 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 it's an interesting story, but the aliens are represented very stupidly in the game. Oh, I don't, I don't think they that's just a they just but float around. I don't like just the random floating crap. I mean, you've got this uh, what I consider a pretty awesome background, pretty awesome animated character. You know, I would have preferred he fought uh, like other humans, basically, or something that looked. You know, less lame. The aliens in this are just—they they look like they crawled right out of Space Invaders, uh, for the most part. Oh, I disagree with that. I think the the aliens are very diverse. They they span from. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of just floating heads, but they've also got these huge mechanized uh, uh, weapon turrets that they can get into. Um, they've got. Weapons built into the architecture with these flaming heads that shoot out of the wall. I mean, walls. the monkeys look good. Uh, uh, the the, or, the things that are reaching down, those are cool looking. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's the garbage game. I'm just saying I I would have liked to. Have, uh, it's not the direction I would have went. Uh, the jumping and stuff uh, is uh, d not the easiest. Uh, again, this is a game. These are made to play with the uh, with the. Uh, uh, the the joysticks on the Coco, so that you've got those there those analog joysticks are they're a whole different level of stick, uh, and this doesn't. So if you're playing this with like the converter, it doesn't translate real well. I played this, I emulated this and played it. You know, I have played both, uh, and uh, if if you tinker around with the emulation, you can get a pretty decent joystick response. If, but you, it takes some it takes some fooling around uh, to get to get it perfect. Uh, but overall, you know, this is not a game I come back to in the Coco. It's again, it's this is a uh, this was a real aggressive title to put on here. You had you really took a lot of jack, but I just don't find it. I'm like yeah. you, I don't find enough uh, gameplay there to, to make me want to come back to it. Uh, this and it, now, the thing is, this proves. I mean, this is almost like a tech demo for the Coco. I mean, this proves you could do something uh, along these lines. I kind of wish we'd see more games that, of this of this type. You know, but but you know that this is an anomaly. Uh, and and this will cost you. Uh, even back, I mean, at least back in the day, back in the day when this was released, thirty bucks. Yeah, thirty that's about bucks. Right. Uh, well, I think that's for a fifteen-minute game for a game that can be ran in fifteen minutes. I think that's asking. Clearly, a little you much. didn't price a lot um, of car, a, a cocoa cartridges back when you were a child. Because that you weren't you weren't that, well, walking out of, of you weren't not. walking out of Radio Shack with a fifteen dollar cart. They were going to get you for some. But money. what I'm what I'm saying is for thirty bucks uh, in eighty eight when this was released, uh, you could there was more out there that you could do with thirty bucks. Um, 
you can get this on eBay right now, 30 bucks. <laughs> it held its value. <laughs> so I guess it has maintained its value. I, uh, um, probably 30 bucks is not, you gotta, I mean, if I, if I'd seen this title as, first of all, here you've got a, 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 a title that's, that was made by, that was put out by Epics. And so this was a, this was a title that had been, was on other machines. You've got to understand that as a Coco owner, just the fact that you're getting a game that appeared on other machines is, is pretty unusual. That's not something you saw every day. And the, and if you looked at the screenshots of this, you'd be like, holy smokes. You know, and even playing, like I said, it's not a bad game. It's just not my cup of tea. Uh, but I, I don't think I don't think they priced it out too far. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's again, on the on the Coco, that would have been an unusual title in itself, just having something that you could have played somewhere else. So, yeah, Kurt, Curtis and says it's an investment, the, not the a game. The box art for this, <laughs> in my opinion, very misrepresentative of the game. Uh, the box art has you already in your suit flying around. And once you do get the suit, uh, you do fly around. I mean, you actually can, you don't run and jump anymore. You actually fly. You can fly completely vertical through many, many screens if you want. Uh, so it does offer diverse gameplay in that perspective. Once you're in your suit, you're flying around. Uh, once you get your lasers, although I was never able to do it, uh, I, I did watch video. Once you get your lasers, you're shooting aliens instead of throwing the the bolt is a a very straight across the screen shot. Um, you know, so it the game does evolve, and I will give it that. There are interesting bits if you can get past the clunkiness uh, in the very beginning. There are more interesting bits down the line, and I'm okay with that in a game. Um, I just think that the clunky bits are really clunky, uh, and it takes a little bit of dedication to get there. And unfortunately, uh, for me, the game, the interesting level of the game wasn't high enough for me to get invested to get to uh, farther parts of the game. So that's where I stand on it. I believe we had some re re user reviews on this as well, Aaron, yeah, correct? Yeah, we did have... Uh... We had one fellow, our good buddy Frodo, chimed in on this one. Uh, he writes, uh, originally known as the Sacred Armor of uh, Antirod. By the way, how do, what do you think of that name? Which one do you like better? Rad Warrior yeah. sucks. Uh, Rad Warrior sounds more like a uh, cool guy. But yeah, the other one sounds cooler. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Frodo continues. This is a decent mixture of platformer and a maze game. Graphically, the Cocoa version is not, up, is not quite up to the level of the C64 or the Amstrad CPC versions. But it's still quite decent. The biggest issue I have with the game is the sh is shared between all the versions of the game is way too short for a full price game. After only a few tries, I'm now able to complete this game in about ten minutes. Had this uh, been a budget title, the score would have been a point higher, six out of ten. So there you go. And he uh, and I think that's very fair. Yeah, he say he does note that ten minute run is on the specy version since the keys are redefinable now. Did you try this with the keyboard, by the way? I played this with a oh, joystick. Okay. I played it with an analog stick. I, I had and, much more uh, success with the keyboard. I will say that uh, than than I did with the joystick. I uh, uh, I call this one a swing, uh, an aggressive swing, but sort of a miss for me on this one. Yeah, I, I think if you have um, a way to emulate this, I, I don't think the TRS-80 is the best version of, of just the ones I flipped through. I think the Apple II was the most impressive because the Apple II is not known for uh, uh, what this game puts on there. I, I thought it looked incredible and actually sounded incredible on the Apple II. Uh, so I think if you're going to seek this game out, that might be one place I would go. I didn't look at it on uh, the Amstrad or the Spectrum, so I don't know how those stack up. It's, it's funny that a game but, like this would be released on so many platforms. I never would have guessed that, to be honest with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know, at very, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's released for quite yeah. a few, and, and and very different platforms. This wasn't something where they just took the code and twisted it a few times and put it on something else. These were full conversions they very had good. to do. Very good. Well, there you go, Rad Warrior. An, an interesting game, an anomaly uh, on the color computer in terms of what it was. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, I will take the next game here. You know... I, I really had to struggle to think of which game. I wanted to do something that was a little bit different uh, and uh, that maybe a lot of people hadn't heard of. 
And so, and you had sort of picked an innovative title there in a lot of ways, and so I wanted to sort of match you. And so what I ended up picking uh, was a game I own, actually, and it was called The Interbank Incident, Brent. Now, have, have you heard of The Interbank Incident yeah. before this? You know, just from the title, I have uh-huh. not. But once I loaded the game up, I have absolutely definitely yeah, played this We in did the past. have this one back in the day, a liberated uh, version of this of this particular game. Now, I find this game uh, itself rather anomalous in a lot of ways because uh, what you had here was a game that actually uh, allowed you to do a lot of things that uh, most Coco games did not. Uh, now, the Interbank Incident is a graphic role-playing game with a, a, a icon and pull-down menu-driven system of gameplay. We've played a lot of games. Yeah, it's a point it, it is. Now, we've played a lot of games on the Coco that have a to- our graphic adventure games that are, are text-based with the picture at, to- at the top. You know, stuff like Trek Boer uh, comes to mind, uh, and those sorts of games. Or Dallas Quest is another one where you've got a graphic representation of what you're being, uh, you know, what you're seeing. Then you've got the text. You type in the text commands like you would in a traditional text game. That's how you play the game. Uh, this game... And I'm not sure how many of these got released on the Coco. I mean, I, if there if there are more than this one, I don't think I've played them. This being an entirely icon and menu driven game, uh, where you don't really do any typing, uh, is very unique. Now listen to this. Listen to what you can do on this, uh, Brent. Uh, not only does this thing support the uh, color computer mouse, that's right, the color computer mouse, which we we didn't yeah. even have that, and I don't have one now. No. Uh, uh, but uh, this support, and really, I would recommend the color computer mouse. I mean, you can use the joystick, but the mouse is the way to go. And I ended up, I played this on the Coco, but I ended up going to the emulator just so I could use the mouse because to make it easier to get around. This also uh, supports uh, the speech pack, all right? And I remember doing this back in the day, uh, despite the fact that we had no multi-selector uh, uh, pack to do it. We just ripped the thing out. <clears throat> but... Of course, this being a multi-disc game, uh, I, <laughs> we must have been out of our minds because that meant we would have been pulling the disc drive uh, controller out of the cartridge slot, putting in the speech pack, and then when it asked for the other disc, pulling the speech pack back out and putting in the cartridge, uh, the cartridge for the floppy drive, which is insane. How we didn't blow that cocoa Yeah, up. we didn't. Yeah, know. I know. <laughs> but anyway, this has speech pack support, and it will basically read you the dialogue. If, if you want it to, yeah, and it uh, and you'll make some uh, miscellaneous sound effects. The speech pack is neat. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, I believe you know I didn't try it with the speech because I, I as I recall the speech pack it's, and Curtis is in here. He can correct me if I'm wrong. The speech pack doesn't get along with the Coco Three unless you make a modification, as I recall. Um, so, but this also supports speech. So you've got speech and the mouse. Here's the real kicker, Brent. This also supports hard drive installation that's right uh, you, this is an os9 game so you could actually you could install this and multitask with this game that is stunning uh, i did not know that until i read it on curtis's site but it is written in the in the rule in the manual and it show it t- tells you how to actually install this game uh this game when you boot this up on your coco most games you use the old load m quote the name of the game this one, if you do a director on the disc, it's all jacked up because all you do is type DOS. It loads up its own yeah. DOS, and you know it loads everything. So it's that. This is a whole different level of game than what you would be used to, and I give them kudos for that. I mean, it's neat. I mean, think about it because this this game uh, this was this game came out in '86. You know, right around that time. So you know, this is late in the in the game, but still pretty interesting. '85, '86. Uh, and was uh, st- stuck out there by Spectral Associates, which I always thought was a cool name. Uh, so, the, you talked about a, a, your elaborate backstory uh, in your game. You you've never seen an elaborate backstory <laughs> until you've re- until you've looked into this game. Uh, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I mean, first of all, the manual for this thing is a is pretty much a must because there's a probably a, a six page story about what's going on uh, uh in, yeah. in, in this game it's I mean, a lo- it gives you a, it gives you a blurb in the beginning it does so but ultimately I'll, i'm just going to read the back of the box here to give you an idea uh the situation is grave the code book 
controlling a top-secret experimental satellite has been stolen. In the wrong hands, this satellite could do almost anything. Can you collect the clues and tips in order to find the crooks and regain control of the satellite? A new concept in adventure games, the Interact Incident uses high-resolution graphics and the latest technology of icons and pull-down windows. All the commands are made with your joystick or mouse with simple, concise, easy-to-understand icons. I love that. That's exactly what it is. Uh, you, that sums it up nicely. So, what are you looking at when you boot? When you actually start playing this game? Well, you've got the upper screen, uh, which is a, which is again, this displays what you're seeing, and it's also animated. Most of the time when we play these games, you just sort of get a static screen up there, Brent, as you know. This one you get, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's not, there's not, they're not, the, the boing ball's not bouncing around up there or anything. But what you are getting are is cloud movement or water movement or something like that. You get something to let you know, hey, this is, there's something going on here. Which I think, I, you know, I appreciate that, that sort of attention. Um, so, yeah, you... Please yeah, go, go your ahead. characters. Some characters also have little animations and whatnot. Yeah, right, right, right. Now, so what you've got a series of icons below the picture. Okay, you've got an eyeball, and that one lets you uh, see what's around you. Then you've got now this one here. <laughs> I could not believe this, and I remember this once I fooled with it. You've got an uh, like a uh, uh, magnifying glass. Okay, this lets you look at something on the screen magnified and this does this it's the, it's the whole cis enhanced thing yeah this does this in in this isn't a, a a gimmick like if you put this on over something on the screen it literally blows that piece of screen up it blow i yeah. mean <laughs> have you could you believe that and, <laughs> and, and it you works can take that same section that you've blown up and blow it up again yes and, and again, again and again five times yeah. It lets you go up to five times magnification. And what's something. amazing about this is the fact that, like, you can see stuff on the, for example, on the very first screen, there's a card laying at your feet down the ground, right? You can zoom in until you can read what the card says. Like, you can't read yeah. it until you zoom. That blew yeah. my mind. You know, that's astounding. Yeah, things like signs, this is where it's used a ton. Uh, when you are standing at the screen initially, Signs will just be rectangles, and you can tell that there's lines on it to indicate it's a sign, but there's no way of reading it because yeah. it's all just pixels. Yeah. It, and then you use that enhance, and it blows it up when one time's usually enough, and then you can see what the sign says and all the text, but you yeah. can even zoom in again, and it's used to solve puzzles sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Very, I mean, this was a quite a piece of kit right there. So then you've got the hand icon. And that's that's the do stuff you would you would basically you know grab stuff stuff like that take objects uh, out of your inventory that sort of thing. Uh, then you've got talk that does what you think it does. You could hit talk and you could talk to the people uh, that are that are around you. Uh, you've also got the uh, you've also got like a a foot that, that lets you travel around. I like the traveling this Brent because. Uh, you actually click when you click the foot, it get, a compass comes up, and it will tell you basically where you can go. You know, very handy. You know that although it's somewhat problematic, it can be because sometimes you will move left, and on the screen that you move into, right will be an option, but it will not take you back to the same screen. Yeah, right. And, that's kind of annoying. And, and, all, and sometimes also you can click on like a doorway. Uh, that's that's another thing I noticed. Uh, you've also got like a pointy finger. That's basically that. That's your. That's your like. Uh, I think that's the one. Is that the one that you use stuff with the two hands? I always, I got confused perpetually. And you've also got a one question. One hand is pick up, and one hand is is, is give. Yeah. And then yeah, that's the give hand. And then you've got a question mark there to that'll give you little hints, right? So those are your controls that you use throughout the game. Uh, and they, you know, and by the way, uh. uh uh, in in eighty five, I'd have to go back and see what was being released in eighty five, all across uh, all the eight bits and and whatnot. But I can tell you that I, this is my first time seeing a, an interface like this. I I remember distinctly thinking, "What is this?" You know, it seemed very confusing to a young lad at the time because I'd never seen anything like it. But in actuality, this is a step forward into the modern realm of, of uh, you know, point-and-click adventures, like you said, and you, something you probably wouldn't have expected to see on the Coco. Now, so you've got the crazy backstory 
you've got the interface, but they're not done blowing your mind yet because you also get to pick your character. And your care yeah. and the, I'm not going to read all their descriptions, but you've got uh, you've got like seven different characters to choose from, uh, different sexes, races, the whole nine yards. You've got everything from uh, James Bond ripoffs to farmers. You know, you've got uh, uh, the clumsy blonde. You've got the geek. You know, you've got all these different people, and each one of the people have a little backstory, including all their yeah. and then in the manual here they're listed as well. And they actually have they bring different things to the table. Now, I would love to sit here and tell you how these various things play or don't play into what you do, but I'm not 100 percent sure uh, because I my abilities, much like in most point uh, point clicking adventures, were minimal. I just sort of wandered around trying aimlessly to to get to make things happen. But uh, I believe that it, it goes kind of off the maniac mansion thing. Some characters will be able to do something another character can't, uh, but it's all it's all uh, alternate ways to get to the same point. Yeah, uh, the uh, the way I, I checked out a bunch of different areas and you know you interacted, did some stuff. It's actually quite neat. I mean, it plays it plays to me like most point and click games. I mean, there was I thought the the Coco really did a good job of playing this an excellent job. playing this game now. I since I'm no good, I, I what I did was believe it or not, this is one of the few games I found for the Coca that has a fact, like a walkthrough fact, and so and I it was needs it. I was because <laughs> you this game you visit multiple cities, uh, yeah. you visit Rio, you visit uh, Paris, uh, you visit Munich, and you visit Seattle, uh, and you're going to casinos and you're going to uh, air, air, you know museums you're going all over the place i mean this is a really expansive this ain't going to be one of these 15 minute games i mean this thing's going to take you a while to go through and if you look at i I watch i read a couple of these what it took to beat the game with these characters i mean it is unbelievable the depth in this thing it's just really uh it's a real uh surprise to me now this depth does come at a price uh, this is a this is a three disc game, uh, so you have and of course you've got uh, uh, three five of a quarter inch. Disc. Now I played this, uh, I emulated this most of the time, but I used the uh, emulation was set with so it would actually load stuff on the disc and hear the disc sound that whole shtick. And so you're not going to buzz through this, but this the disc loading stuff wasn't that bad. You know, the plot of this is real interesting. Uh, the interbank is the is the corporate is the like the sort of a quasi government corporation that's behind this mystery and the mystery really expands. I mean, if you really start reading into all the stuff they did, because the the uh, the section of the book that tells you about what's happened, it's really interesting. It's well well uh, well written, and they the interbank is this real shady outfit. They've got their hands in all sorts of different pies, and the code book that was stolen. Controls a satellite that Interbank put up there that is used. They can use it to guide missiles in and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was, uh, it was covertly stolen. Like they made it look like it wasn't part of the theft, and they barely caught it. I mean, this is pretty high level dialogue and stuff in this. Uh, some of the downsides of this, the uh, I can see where the text can be a little tough to read at times. Again, you're using the Coco mouse. Now, I don't have a Coco mouse, and so when I emulated this, I had to use a, a Windows mouse, and so I had to set it up. And so you're going to go in there and have to, since uh, you're going to set this thing up uh, a certain way when you emulate it to make the mouse work right, and that includes turning down the the uh, uh, the because the default in Mame defaults the uh, analog it sets back to a centered joystick. You've got to basically turn that down to zero, turn the sensitivity down. But once you do that, it's pretty good, you know. But that's I think there's a barrier to entry on this, especially if you've got uh, an actual Coco, because I really think this is a game that's best served uh, using that when that um, the the Coco mouse, which I'm I think is probably pretty rare, to be honest with you. I've like I said, I've never seen one. I know. Uh, the Coco Talk guys, I'm sure it's guys like that would have some of these things lying around, but I've never, I don't think I ever saw one ever. Did you ever remember seeing one of these even in the Radio Shack brand? Uh, I don't. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the mouse was just a foreign idea at this time. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say, 
uh, if you want to play this game, and if if you are into point and click adventures and you want to see stuff that the Coco can do that you didn't think were possible, one hundred percent give this game a run. Yeah, uh, there are quirks that I want to get into, but just to center on what you were talking about just then about the mouse, um, other emulators outside of Mame do a much better job with mouse emulation and making it easy. Oh, yeah? Uh, I, I did not run this in MAME. I ran this in a separate emulator and it fired it right up, told it I had a mouse. It was like, okay, whatever, man, and I was on my way. Yeah. So uh, there are ways to get around the mouse issue outside of MAME uh, to make it easier. Uh, oh, once you make those few adjustments, it works. it worked fine in MAME. Now, Brent, now you remembered vaguely uh, playing this back in the day, but what did you think of this coming back to it? Uh, this was amazing. Yeah. Um, now, a few flaws. Yeah. And I, I, I want to get these out of the way so I don't have to talk about them anymore. Um, the game transferring from scene to scene is slow. Uh, yeah. You are looking at, you know, five to ten seconds between scene transitions and sometimes when you go somewhere that you've already been and you don't want to go that way again, it's just 30 minutes or 30 seconds of wasted time. It sucks. And it's a huge drag when you are you want to try something that you think might work. And when you go through all this headache and then you get there and it doesn't work, it's a double drag. OK, that's out of the way. That's part of being on a computer that it was on. Let's not talk about it again. <laughs> Thing number two. You have a talk option, and unfortunately, almost all the characters I've talked to or tried to talk to just said they were too busy right now, they didn't want to talk. And at the very beginning of the game, you can't do that. It pulled me out of the story, because I wanted to interact with this world. I wanted to, uh, you know, become, I wanted to get lost in it, and that kind of stuff really pulls you out. The very first thing you can do is go into a bookstore. And if you talk to the clerk behind the counter, she's just like, no, nah, I don't want to talk to you. I I'm too busy to talk to you right now. <clears throat> it's like, come on, put any dialogue in there and it'd be okay. Uh, so that I, I was really annoyed by that. Uh, third very annoying thing is, like I mentioned before, when you pull up the compass, you might go left. And then you're saying, like, okay, I don't want to be here. I want to go back to the other screen. And you try to go right. And you're not where you were. So I don't know if they just messed up the map or if they had some kind of weird idea of, of maybe you're going kind of left and forward and then right and forward again. But you can't do that in a game. Those three things aside, those are three things that really annoyed me about the game. However, this being on a Coco is mind-boggling. The graphics are incredible. Everything looks like what you think it would be. I mean, all the uh, people that you interact with or try to interact with have individual looks. You can tell when someone is, is a clerk. You can tell when someone is like a, basically a hobo. You can tell <clears throat> all these different personalities just by the way they look. Uh, all of the scenes are drawn out in spectacular detail. Most of them are basically static. Some of them do have a little bit of animation, and the little bit of animation is very helpful. The icons at the bottom of the screen, for the most part, are very descriptive. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you click on something and try to interact with something, it does what you expect it to do. Uh, you know, if you're trying to hand someone money, you actually click on that and then click on the money and you hand it to them, and it does what you exactly what you think it would do um the detail in the game with the zoom feature and be able to find hidden aspects that way is incredible um unfortunately i did have the the game and i'm sure this is an emulator thing i had the game crash on me several times uh, which had me redoing the same beginning content over and over so i did not get as far in this game as I wanted to. Uh, but I do plan on going back to Interbank Incident uh, because of 
being on a Coco, seeing this experience is so amazing that I'm going to go back and give it another yeah. shot. That's, you know, you're, you're summing up what I'd hope to bring out, which is, I think, uh, it's funny. I, when I bought that huge lot of Coco stuff a couple years ago, uh, this was amongst the, uh, items that I got. Uh, and, uh, I, I, uh, I looked at the box. I was like, you know, I just don't remember this. And then once I loaded it up, I was like, oh yeah, you know, this one's coming back to me. But at the time, it, I, it was lost on me what I was looking at. But this really is, I think this is a true hidden gem uh, uh, on the on the Coco for people that are in this. It reminds me of the first time I played Deja Vu on the Amiga. It's just like the interface blew me away. And the fact that this was uh, something that, you know, that I had not experienced before was stunning. And this is the same thing I, back in the day. The fact that this has mouse support and speech support and is hard drive installable uh, is they, I like that they were forward thinking they were trying to to modernize this game uh, and and they didn't lose anything in the gameplay to do it I mean they made everything great now are you going to have the speech back read all the dialogue probably not you know I remember even back in the day turning that off uh, but uh, it's still it's neat that it's there and you get you know a little bit of uh, you know special effects with it. Just a, I think this is a real neat game. Uh, it, again, it's not the kind of game that I get into, but this, in terms of depth, is one of the uh, just from reading the fact and stuff. It's super duper deep. It's well written. Yeah. And the guys did a great job on it. I highly recommend this one. Um, so let's see what our Discord people thought about this one. Frodo had a look at this thing. He says, "Interesting early point and click adventure. The ability to choose which agent to play is nice." Especially since the choice actually influences how to play the game to quite a large extent. Given the limited graphical abilities of the Coco 1 and 2, the graphics are quite nice. What a shame that the interface is not more intuitive, especially the way the pointing finger button is used to give extra functionality to most other buttons is irritating. Deciding on a score for this is difficult for me. Back in the day, I probably would have loved this, but I no longer have the patience for this kind of point and click adventure six and a half out of ten and i can understand that if uh, score if, if this is not your bag uh a six and a half but i mean i think that this is a game that if you have a, a interest in point and click stuff and i don't you know i tried to look around to see i thought this got released on other systems uh and and maybe someone out there knows but i i don't know if it did or not there's not a ton out there uh on this game uh, i was kind of surprised uh that there was so little uh, but uh, if this is one that I would definitely check out, and I can't imagine it being any better on any other machine than it is on the uh, on the Coco, I think this I think this one here's a real winner, my friend. And it sounds like you thought the same thing. Yep, I'll have to agree. All right, and you know what else is a winner? Me? Nope. Oh <laughs> no, it's the wheel, you idiot! What a loser! <laughs> Brent, tell them what we added this week. Uh. We only had to change out the Retro Rewind slot, and we put uh, the Jupiter Ace back into the Retro Rewind slot. That's right. All the locked pieces stay locked. Yep, I'm going to spin know, this sucker. It's like a lock. Yeah, all right. I'm going to spin this sucker right now. Here we go. Let me move to the big cam. All right, here we go. Ugh! We've got, oh my God, oh, this is another Brent Spectacular, the Sibico Extreme. <laughs> what in the, the, the what? The Sibico Extreme, C-Y-B-I-K-O, Extreme, spelled cool guy style. What, tell me Brent, <laughs> what, what do you know about the Sibico or Sibico Extreme? Uh, I don't remember making a piece for it. <laughs> you, you idiot! The Sibico Extreme. I I hate you so much. What were you thinking? <laughs> so remember when we did Coco stuff? Yes. That was fun. <laughs> so next week, my I don't know how to pronounce this thing. Is this a Sibico Extreme? It has, it has to be a handheld. Why do you say yeah, that? Yeah, Yama says it's a handheld. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Well, listen. This is the week we pop the big rating when all the Sibico Extreme fans come crawling out of the woodwork <laughs> to get some sweet Sibico 
Simico action. Remember when we did the Coco stuff? Boy, that was fun. But now it's time for Simico Extreme. I like any console that's extreme, Brent. Oh, and it's Russian, so it'll be easy. Oh, God. <laughs> Brent, do you have any shout-outs you'd like to make this week? Uh, Yeah, let me say hi to a few people in chat. We got Frodo, Curtis, uh, Pixels at Dawn, Michiyama, uh Picard 2010, Duncan Styles. Uh, Hermski stopped by, and then let me pull up our lurker, pick a lurker out here. Let's say hello to Buck Owens. Uh, Chris Foles in chat today, and let me pick out one more here. Oh, our newest uh, member of the ARG supporters, Z9K9, is in chat. Very good. Uh, speaking of all that goodness... We do have a new supporter video at the end of the video, so keep on watching. Very good, very good. Hey, I want to plug uh, our international computer club, uh, which will record next Saturday. That's That'll be uh, September 12th at 5 p.m. That's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, all right? Your mileage may vary. Uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you are a member of the Amigos uh, Discord, uh, the details will be in the International Computer Club channel. Uh, this will be a gathering of people throughout the world. We got we got hosers from the Great White North in there. We got Pat, we got people from the UK. We got Germans, people from the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, like all over the place, Brent. Uh, even states outside of West Virginia will be represented. There are a oh. few. Yeah, that's right. And <laughs> and this will be international love, my friend. It'll be, uh, uh, you know, eh, an hour and a half or so of people doing little presentations, people chatting about uh, classic hardware, classic consoles, heck, new stuff. There's no limits, Brent. It's crazy time. This will be taking place on Zoom. The Zoom address will be... Uh, put out in the uh, Discord channel. And this is also, if you're not interested in showing up and having your face up on the screen, uh, this is also going to be playing on Twitch. So you can uh, hop over to our Twitch channel and check out all the proceedings. Should be a good time, Brent. Any thoughts on the International Computer Club? Sounds fun. I will definitely try to be there. A ringing endorsement, as always. So, next week, Brent, the Civico Extreme, I am scared to death of this one so thanks i know you've done it again <laughs> thanks everybody for joining us uh we'll catch you guys on the flip side thanks for joining us today we really hope you enjoyed the show quick shout out to all of our youtube subscribers and twitch followers a special thank you to duncan styles for our vector graphics and bartbit for our amazing music would you like to keep arg spinning for as little as a dollar a month you can do so at anchor.fm slash ARG presents. Supporters get entry into the Amigos Discord channel as well as their name called out in the credits. Supporters like these fine folks, Xenon Canine, Anthony Jarvis, Graham W. Vetke, Terry Howard, Gary Heather, John Schaller, The Slow Norris, Frodo NL, Steve Rasmussen, Chris Folds, Mitsuyama, Retroalgy, Hermski, John Dackman, and Jerry Dennington. Don't want to explain another credit card bill? That's okay too. You can help us out by leaving us a positive review on Spotify and Apple iTunes. Have an idea for a wheel piece? Send it to us at argpresents at mail.com. We record live every Sunday at 9 a.m. EDT on Twitch. Hope to see you there.